Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. He is the only player in baseball history whose first two home runs were grand slams. And three times in the span of a month, he broke up no hitters with a base hit in the ninth inning. He is also someone whom I remember as larger than life. After all, he was a New York Yankee. Despite not being the superstar several thought he'd develop into. Next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, a conversation about Horace Clark. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 87, Horace Clark. As always, I hope everyone is doing well and making it through these trying times unscathed. You know, when I started this podcast a few years ago, I created the definition of a sports forgotten hero as someone who had a great career but was overshadowed by someone else he played with or someone who had one phenomenal year or even just one crazy good game. The definition can mean so many different things. And of course, since I created the podcast, I can choose players from any sport whom I deem as a hero or someone who should be remembered. So how does Horace Clark fit this definition? Well, I grew up in Westchester County, New York as a New York Mets fan. But as a sports fan, I still wanted to go to as many games as I could and see as many teams as I could, regardless of the sport, stadium, or the teams playing. My sister, for whatever reason, liked the Yankees more than the Mets. So we would go see the Yankees as well. And this was during the time the Yankees were experiencing down years. They were not a contender. They weren't winning pennant after pennant, and they did not have the biggest stars of the game. But there was one player on the Yankees who exemplified, at least to me, what the Yankees were at the time. A good team, not a great team, and not the worst team. And that was Horace Clark. He was good, not great, and certainly not bad. Horace was a contact hitter, let off for the Yankees, and could swipe a base when needed. In fact, for his career, he averaged 19 stolen bases a year with a high of 33 coming in 1969 when he also hit a career high 285. But there were two things that really stuck with me about Horace. First, he always wore a helmet in the field instead of a cap. And second, I went to bat day at Yankee Stadium. My sister got a Jake Gibbs bat and I got a Horace Clark bat that is now probably disintegrated somewhere in the Croton dump. As a collector of sports memorabilia, I can't believe I don't have either of those bats anymore. So, while he might not match the exact definition of what I set out to do on Sports Forgotten Heroes, he was certainly one of the most recognizable faces on the Yankees. And when you consider where he came from, the U.S. Virgin Islands, not exactly a hotbed for Major League talent, he was certainly a hero to the folks back home and his contributions to developing a better brand of baseball for the youth of Fredericksted after his playing days were over cannot be overlooked. Now, before we get to today's show with my guest, Rory Costello, just a few reminders. 
Please follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Follow SFH on Instagram and look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook. And for more about the stars I talk about, my guests, and more links, visit SportsFH.com. And folks, I would love to hear from you. Let me know what you think about the podcast. If you have a forgotten hero you would like to know more about, let me know. Just go to sportsfh.com and submit your comments, questions, or suggestions. Again, that's sportsfh.com. As always, thank you for listening. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please give this podcast a five-star rating. Okay, enough self-promotion. Let's get to today's conversation with Rory Costello, a terrific researcher who has written many bios for the Sabre Bio Project. Rory, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Glad you could be here. Thank you, and the same. Hey, um, great topic tonight in an unfortunate time. Horace Clark, who just recently passed away, but was definitely a um, a fan favorite. And in fact, I remember as a kid growing up as a Mets fan, still going to Yankee Stadium and going to bat day and getting a Horace Clark bat. Well, I was a Mets fan, too. But my uh, memory of Horace Clark being a 70s kid as well was that I used to just look at the box scores and he'd always be on top of the Yankee box scores being a leadoff man. And being a baseball card collector, I noticed that he was from the Virgin Islands. And I noticed Mm -hmm. that Elrod Hendricks, another one of the 70s players, was from the Virgin Islands. And then it was maybe a couple years later, we went on a family vacation to St. Croix Mm. and it planted the seed in my mind. And uh, then it came around the late nineties when I thought that I would like to do a research project for Sabre. And I thought to myself, what's something that hasn't been done before? What hasn't been written about before? And then it came to me, the ball players from the Virgin Islands. Oh, there you go. Very cool topic. So, um, you know, Rory, while most people think that the uh, the New York Yankees have always been good or great. The period between, oh, about the mid-1960s into the 70s, they struggled. Sure, you know, they had some good players, and they were developing a few that could carry them into the late 1970s, but they were not a contending team. Some of those names were Ron Blumberg, you know, the first ever DH, Celerino Sanchez, Jerry Kenny, guys that, for the most part, baseball fans don't know. But, of course, there was the beginning of the career of Thurman Munson. Bobby Mercer was a star. And I think one of the more recognizable names of that time for the Yankees was Horace Clark. So before we dive into Horace's story, let's first talk about this Yankee team. How did this proud dynasty fall like it did? Well, the phrase I use in the beginning of the Horace Clark bio is that I refer to it as a Roman Empire-like dry rot, and then it got exposed by the CBS ownership. And then if you want to look back on it uh, further, they were reluctant, the Yankees, to hire African-American and Latin American players. And that actually changed a little bit with the likes of Horace Clark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, talk about uh, CBS and their ownership of the team, um, if you can. I mean, most people today would think of the Steinbrenner family as the the owners forever, but in fact, you know, Steinbrenner bought the team from CBS. What can you tell us about CBS's ownership of the team and how the team really uh, uh, hit rock bottom under them? Well, I'm not that well-versed in Yankees history, but I would recommend that uh, if people want insight into that era, they could do well to read the biography of Mike Burke, who was the Yankees exec 
uh, under the CBS administration and was really overseeing the team largely in those years. He was a very flashy and colorful character, but he wasn't really a baseball man. And so it's also written by Warren Corbett, who happens to be one of Sabre's best writers. Hmm. So for insight into those years of the Yankees, definitely go to the Mike Burke bio. But I take a somewhat contrary view of the so-called Horace Clark era, which is that the Yankees were not all bad during that time. You know, for example, in uh, 1970, they won 93 games. It just so happens that the Orioles won 108 and just outclassed the Yankees. And then in 72, they were well in contention you know, into mid-September, and then they had a slump late in the season. So it's, it's only very brief periods in Yankee history that the club has been truly terrible, like mm-hmm. 66 and 67 right. and the Stump Merrill years in the early 90s. Yankees fans are spoiled. <laughs> they sure are. But they did have Horace Clark. Tell us a little well, bit. Yeah, yeah go he, ahead. He became known as the Horace Clark era just because he was there throughout and he was very visible at the top of the lineup and he was in there day in and day out. So he got the label. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about the type of ball player he was. What were his strengths? What were his weaknesses? Well, I think he would have been he was a leadoff man because he was fast. He his wheels were his best attribute and he was a good glove man, but because in those days people thought of just putting a fast man at the top of the lineup no matter what, he didn't have the best on base percentage. He was a contact hitter and he put the ball in play. And I actually looked at it, and I thought to myself that Roy White would have been a terrific leadoff man, another Yankee stalwart from those years, because he had a much better on-base percentage, and he was also a fast man. But because the Yankees lineup was kind of thin, uh, Ralph Houck, the manager, said, I can't spare him at the top of the lineup. Mm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, what about the fans? I remember, like we, like I said just before, even as a Mets fan, that he was one of the Yankees, the, the fan favorites. Why? What was it about his personality or game that the fans really liked? Well, he was a very humble man. He, he was very self-effacing. And I remember he told me when I interviewed him in uh, 1999, I was just one little infielder, one of 25 guys. I wasn't any Superman. And he was he had a kind of hard hat approach to the game, literally, in fact, because mm-hmm. he would wear his helmet in the field. Now, uh, we're going to get to... Um... We're going to get to uh, his helmet in in, in just a bit because I do have a a couple of questions about that. Um, Now, like we said earlier, he didn't grow up here in the States. You grew up in, and I hope I get this right, Frederickstead, which is one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And he didn't start playing hardball until he was about 13. Talk about the game of baseball in the U.S. Virgin Islands and in particular Frederickstead, and how unlikely it was that a guy like Horace could actually be spotted and signed to a major league contract. Well, that was something that I thought was really interesting when I dug into it. This what I conducted my original research back in 1999 and 2000, and I put out a little self-published book called Baseball in the Virgin Islands. And it really started in the 1950s. In 1954, a man uh, called Fernando Cornero put together a team of just select Virgin Islands players that went to the National Baseball Congress tournament in Kansas. And that one little team had three future major leaguers on it. There was Joe Christopher, who played with the early Mets. There was Elmo Plaskett, who played a little bit with the Pirates in the early 60s. And then there was Julio Navarro, who was a pitcher from Puerto Rico who grew up on St. Croix. And so the talent was there. And when uh, Howie Hake, who was a super scout for the Pittsburgh Pirates, was at the National Baseball Congress in 1954, and he saw Joe Christopher playing there, and he signed Joe Christopher for the Pirates, and it, the, the Virgin Islands became a stop on Howie Hake's itinerary, and they were turning out talent in the 50s and 60s. And so there really was, it was a, a wellspring of baseball talent, especially in the 50s and into the 70s and even beyond. 
How did they become that good? What was it or who who brought baseball there? I mean, did they just start playing? Did they see it in the States? Give me a little bit of, of, of history um, of, of how the game developed there. Well, uh, the islands were bought from Denmark around the late, uh, around the end of World War One, thereabouts. And the U.S. Navy came in, and the Navy introduced the game to the islands, although it's also possible that it may have come from Puerto Rico. But the Navy really helped develop the game in the Virgin Islands. And then there was a local scene, and then its proximity to Puerto Rico was really important. There was a man named Alfonso Gerard who grew up on St. Croix and wound up playing in the Puerto Rican Winter League in the 40s. And so he really you know, planted the flag for the Virgin Islands players in the Puerto Rican League. And that was really instrumental in helping develop a lot of the talent, including guys like Horace Clark. Mm-hmm. Now, was Howie Haig basically the only scout that would go down there? Uh, what, did, did scouts from all the teams go there? Uh, talk about how Howie had sort of like an inside track maybe to seeing the talent down there. Well, he was really the trailblazing scout for all of Latin America. He traveled everywhere, you know, just throughout the Caribbean and into South America. Way ahead. The, the Giants were pretty active in the Dominican Republic and in Puerto Rico, but Howie Hake was the guy who cast his net the widest. And then the Yankees had, obviously, because they signed – Horace Clark, they had a guy, uh, the man who signed Clark was named Jose Seda, and he was a scout for the Yankees. And he was a guy who was involved in various capacities with the Puerto Rican Winter League. Mm -hmm. Now, back to Horace, didn't I read somewhere that when he was first playing the game, baseballs were hard to come by? So instead, Horace and his friends played softball? Well, there was that, and also that there were uh, Frederickstead is a town that's right by the ocean. The stadium was right by the ocean, and if the ball carried too far, it would go into the ocean. Yeah, so basically, um, Horace, who was a switch hitter in the major leagues, um, not only did he take up the game late, but to top it all off, he, along with the rest of the the gang that he played with, um, they all became switch hitters, and that basically came by necessity, did it not? Well, at some level, although in Horace's case, he wound up uh, just switch hitting with the encouragement of his managers and coaches when he was in the minors. Mm -hmm. How did he learn the game? Who taught him? Well, it was really because his dad... Uh, was a cricketer because you know, cricket was also popular in the Virgin Islands. One of the uh, the first guy who was uh, made it to the majors from the Virgin Islands it was a catcher named Valmy Thomas, and he told me that his dad was also a cricketer. And there were a lot of guys in the say the 40s and 50s who played both cricket and baseball. And then uh, cricket kind of faded over time, and baseball became stronger. Did Horace ever play? cricket yeah i don't believe so oh, okay okay um and of course there are similarities between the two scoring and length of game not being one of them um no. at what point did horace clark show an aptitude for the game at such a level that others started to take notice well he was only 17 when he went to the tryout camp that Howie Hake ran in the islands in 1957. And uh, so he didn't make it then. Uh, Howie signed Elmo Plaskett from that camp. But then the next year, he was good enough uh, to make an impression, and the Yankees signed him. And was he an infielder at that time? What kind of ball player was he? What did the Yankees see in Horace Clark or uh, uh, Jose he came Sada? Up as a shortstop. Yeah. Okay. What? What? Did... And or again, really, I, I think the primary thing that they liked about him his his best tool was his speed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. We know that baseball scouts, really scouts from all major sports, are very clever, and they'll go almost anywhere to discover talent. 
Fredericksted was not a hotbed for baseball talent, at least not yet. But you have said that a couple of different ball players were discovered down there. Um, how long did it take or or how were scouts able to evaluate the talent down there as being good enough to take a flyer on considering the the competition that was out on the field? Was the competition that good that a scout could say, that guy's got it? Yeah, well, again, they were sending guys to the Puerto Rican Winter League, which was viewed as just one small step below the major leagues in terms of caliber of play. And then one of the other guys who made it from the Virgin Islands to the majors was pitcher Al McBean. And Howie Hake signed him for the Pirates, and McBean uh, was a photographer. He wasn't even, he was just there at his tryout camp initially to take photos. And then uh, one of his buddies, who was one of the local managers, uh, convinced him to actually get in there and join the tryout. And Howie Hakes signed McBean for a hundred bucks bonus. And <laughs> it turned out that McBean was a great prospect. And then you know, that was another thing that just said to Howie Hake, uh, look, it, it's worth my while stopping in and seeing the talent in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. In your conversations with Horace, did you ever discuss what he might have done had he not been drafted? Do you have any clue as to what his life would have been like without baseball? Would he have stayed there instead of coming to the U.S.? He probably would have been a musician because that was his other big thing, and he pursued it throughout his life. In fact, I remember after I met him in 1999, I wound up going back a few years later to the Virgin Islands again, and I was hoping to see Horace perform. He played vibraphones and xylophone, and I was going to see him perform uh, in a live show, but uh, bad weather, unfortunately, you know, scrubbed the concert. So he even said at one point, you know, the choice between music and baseball, I don't know whether baseball won or music lost. <laughs> Interesting. Um, he decided to take a flyer after being drafted and pursue his baseball dream, and he entered the minor league system of the Yankees with Kearney of the Nebraska State League. His first year, well, I... I it didn't go too well. I mean, he hit just 225 with two homers and 20 RBI, but he swiped 27 bases. Talk about his indoctrination into professional baseball, if you can. Well, there is a, a cultural issue uh, coming from the Caribbean and going to the Midwest. And also, if I recall, you know, there was something to do with night baseball because Horace did eventually wind up needing glasses. And uh, playing night ball was something that was probably new to him as well. Mm hmm. So after his first year, though, he started to climb the ladder in minor league baseball and he played winter ball in Puerto Rico. And it was there, Puerto Rico, where things finally really started to click for Horace. So first, talk about his rise through the minors and the improvements he made. Well, he did uh, credit playing in Puerto Rico in particular, just facing high-level pitching, high-caliber competition for being something that, in addition to the minors, helped uh, him develop as a prospect and become major league ready. Can you recall any of the competition he did play against in Puerto Rico and how that did help sharpen his skills? Well, he was facing the likes of Bob Gibson on the mound, and other really strong pitchers like Earl Wilson and Denny McLean. So Puerto Rico was sort of like this hotbed of unproven talent at that time that was about to explode on Major League Baseball. Well, there was that, but there were also pretty established major leaguers. Uh, by that point, Bob Gibson had already demonstrated what he could do in the majors. Why would a guy like Gibson want to go down to Puerto Rico and play? Money. Strictly money. They, they weren't being paid very well, and so winter ball was an important source of earnings for these guys. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there was so much more to playing in Puerto Rico as well. 
he learned so much more. I mean, I, I, I think this is where he matured and became a man, an adult. Can you talk about the experience as a whole for Horace and the fact that he met his wife, Hilda, in Puerto Rico? Yeah, well, I was going to mention that when you talked about just the all-around cultural experience, he wasn't the only guy who wound up marrying a Puerto Rican woman who came from the Virgin Islands. Al McBean did, Elmo Plaskett did, and Joe Christopher did, too. So really, it was just um, not just about baseball on the islands. It was a social scene as well. You know, Horace's... uh, uh... Horace's experience and his in Puerto Rico and his rise through the miners, the miners in particular, was not meteoric. Rather, it was, I don't know, deliberate, advancing through each class or each level year by year. But finally, though, in 1965, he made his debut with the Yankees. So talk about his steady pace through the minors and how deliberate it, it was and what the Yankees saw in him to finally give him a shot to play in the majors. Well, it was he'd proven himself over time. And then at that point, Bobby Richardson was nearing the end of his career and they were thinking about who was potentially going to be a replacement for Richardson. And Horace came up as a shortstop, but uh, Ralph Houck told him it was in 65, I believe, that uh, when he was uh, a rookie, that he was going to be, uh, they were going to take a look at him at second base with an eye toward potentially replacing Bobby Richardson. Did any of that have to do with the fact that the Yankee dynasty was slowly slipping away and it was time to try some new talent, um, bring some new new blood in there to see what could happen? Well, I'm not sure that they recognized that the wheels were going to fall off. Uh, they just were, they still had Mickey Mantle. They still had... Uh, various other guys, and the, I don't. I don't. I think the Yankees were probably as surprised as anybody that the '65 and especially the '66 and '67 seasons went south like they did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now Horace enjoyed playing in Puerto Rico, and I imagine, like Bob Gibson, um, he continued to play there because money, like you said, but the. The Yankees asked him to stop. Why? Because fear of injury. That was the, they wanted him. uh, I I think there was the fear of injury and also that he would burn himself out playing year round. And Horace didn't care for that at the beginning. He said, that's my winter earnings going down the drain there. Are you going to subsidize me for this loss? But then he realized after a while that maybe it was saving his legs and he didn't mind so much having the time off, and that he was also giving clinics on St. Croix, which he was he was earning a little money for. What were his days as a Yankee like? I mean, did any of the Yankees at this point, especially 66, when they finished last for the first time since I think it was 1912 when, the, when they were known as the uh, the New York Highlanders, what was it like to be a Yankee at that time? Um, well, I, I was shocking, I suppose, because I don't, my memories of the period don't really go back that far, but, I, but my the true memories as a fan start in around 69, 70, in the early 70s. So, and being a Mets fan too, I can't answer for what it was like being a Yankee fan or a, or, or, or a Yankee in those years, but uh, it was uh, my uh, conjecture at any rate is that it, they were as shocked as anybody. Mm-hmm. Tell us about some of the highlights of his career, like the fact that his first home run was a grand slam. His first two homers were grand slams, and because uh, one came in '65, and then the next came. Well, I looked it up, in fact, just recently, uh, and it was the following July, and that was also a grand slam. But I think the, probably the thing that he's best known for as a hitter was being pesky, and that's exemplified by his breaking up three no-hitters in the ninth inning in the span of a month in 1970. Wow. What about in the field? 
How was he in the field? And here's the question. Why did he always wear a helmet? And really, did he ever put on a hat when he was in the field? I mean, he, I guess, George Scott and John Olerud come to mind as guys who wore helmets even when they were in the field. Why did Horace Clark always wear a helmet? I don't know specifically why he wore a helmet in the field, but the knock on him was that he didn't want to uh, accept contact while turning the double play and that he would just hold on to the ball and not try to turn two. So it might have something to do with that. That probably didn't sit well with the guy on the mound, did it? No, because the Yankees had a lot of sinker ball pitchers who lived by the ground ball and lived by turning two, and it did not sit well with them. Hmm. What did the rest of the Yankees think of Horace? Was he a likable guy? What was he like in the clubhouse? Well, again, he was a very modest, uh, soft-spoken, uh, retiring type of fellow, and he was well-liked. And so he, he wasn't uh, one of the boys, but he wasn't somebody who caused trouble. Mm-hmm. Now, his days as a Yankee uh, came to an end in 74. He was a victim of a house cleaning by the Yankees' new owner, George Steinbrenner, and he was dealt to the San Diego Padres. That basically was the end of his career. How would you sum up his career? So I think... Um, they were looking to, uh, I'm not sure if they'd already dealt for Willie Randolph at that point, but they, I think they viewed it was Gabe Paul really, who was the new general manager was wielding the broom and just uh, saying uh, time to look at some new people, time to change the face of the club. And how would you sum up his career? I mean, you, you had conversations with him, um, you, 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 you've spoken with his son. How would you sum up the career of Horace Clark? Well, I think uh, he took a lot of knocks during his playing career because of the sense of entitlement of Yankee fans and the media. But it really, it, it wasn't amazing. It wasn't a great career, but it was a pretty solid career. The, the on-base percentage could have been better. He might have been uh, better off hitting in a, either number two or potentially maybe number eight on the lineup. But he, had, he endured in the majors for, I believe, nine years or ten years. So yeah. you've got to be doing something right to stick around that long. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the reason I selected Horace Clark as a topic for Sports Forgotten Heroes isn't necessarily due to his ability on the field, but rather how Yankee fans just enjoyed having Horace Clark on the team. I mean, Horace was a fan favorite. Yes and no. I, I, I'm not sure if I would go that far while he was an active player, but I think you know, the, the tone has shifted over time that you know, people came to appreciate him and you know, just think back you know, because of the, the era over the passage of time, the, because the Yankees have won so many championships, the sting of not being a big contender from 65 through 74 has faded, and people are willing to look more kindly on that era and guys like Horace Clark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think was the, tone, the tone of articles has definitely shifted over the past decade or two. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a great time for the Yankees. I mean, like I said, they, you know, Jerry Kenny and... Ron Blumberg. It was a it was a different type of Yankees team, that's for sure. What what did he do after his playing days were over? Do you know that? Yes, I do. In fact, that was one of the things that I think he really deserves credit for. He worked as a baseball teacher in the Parks and Recreation Department on St. Croix. And the islands continued to send guys to the minor leagues. And there were even two pretty accomplished major leaguers that came out of the programs that Horace and his buddy Elmo Plaskett ran. Those were Jerry Brown, who played in the 80s and 90s, and Midre Cummings, who played Mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s and into the early 2000s. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In the end, how should we all remember Horace Clark? 
Well, he said it himself. He was just uh, one of 25 men, not any superman, but somebody who did his best when he went out there and put together a solid career and also wound up developing other future prospects, including major leaguers. Well, Rory, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your evening to join me on Sports Forgotten Heroes to talk about a guy who was a Yankee for a a good period of time and a guy who uh, uh, made a mark on the baseball world. And it's a shame that, uh, you know, he passed away as it is with anybody. But again, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me. My pleasure, Warren. Thank you. Many times I wrap sports forgotten heroes with comments as to whether or not I think someone should be in the Hall of Fame, or I recap with something great about the forgotten hero. Horace Clark was not a Hall of Fame caliber ball player. He was just a solid infielder with the New York Yankees, whom I remember as a star for the Yankees when I was growing up. For his career, he hit 256 with 27 home runs, 304 RBI, and 151 stolen bases. So, why not talk about someone whom I remember? A guy who was larger than life when I was growing up. Thanks for listening today. Next time, we're going to go back to football, and we're going to talk about the NFL's oldest team, the Cardinals. Yep. Arizona is actually the oldest team in the game. We'll explore the origins of the team and discover just how the Cardinals might have saved the Chicago Bears from folding. That's next time. For now, thanks again to my guest today, Rory Costello, and thanks to all of you for listening. And I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.